What I want to do first is explain my title of this presentation. And what I mean about growing wild is to think about native, native plants, the ones that grow in the wild, when you think about landscaping in your yard or in your community projects. Now, wild doesn't necessarily mean untamed or untidy, although there are some native plants that just don't behave well enough to be in very traditional, formal, cultivated gardens. However, many natives are sufficiently tame to work in informal guards, yards or even along streetscapes. Painting with natives. I truly believe gardening is an art form. It's a collaboration between us humans um, as the artists and all the fabulous forms and shapes and colors that nature provides with plants. So you have a wonderful opportunity here to explore that collaboration. I have two objectives. I first want to introduce you to the importance of native plants in your yards and in your project. And then I wanna kindle a passion for these plants. So you turn to them when you need to add something or replace something um, either in your yard or in your project. So today we're focusing on herbaceous perennials, the non-woody plants that come back every year. But remember, there are still native trees, native shrubs, and native vines, and a couple native annuals out there. So the best place to start, a definition. Not everyone agrees on it. Um, there's one I've been using here for probably a decade or so of giving this presentation. But more recently, the prevailing thought now recognizes and incorporates the concept of an ecosystem into the native definition. And I'm gonna show you two. This one comes from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, the definition of native now attempts to include the connection between the plant and the other parts of the ecosystem, including all the organisms. And when I say ecosystem, I'm talking about a biological community of plants and animals interacting among themselves and among their physical parts of their environment. Here's a second one. If nothing else today, I want you to be exposed to the concept of connect connectivity. Everything in nature is somehow connected. The native plants are connected with where they are and what else is living with them. And that interconnectedness actually comes all the way down to humans too. As humans, we are part of nature, we're dependent on nature, and sometimes we are dependent upon. Uh, there's more examples to come. Dr. Tallamy, who came up with this definition, he'll, he'll, You'll find him in this presentation in several different places. More definitions that I think we really need to go to understand before we go further. And it helps us to get a handle on the whole plant universe. You'll see these terms sometimes in, in the media or in things that you read about. And it's really good to understand what they mean. So if a plant gets introduced, from another area or a country or a continent, either accidentally or on purpose, we call that an exotic plant. So plants, think about that, plants native to the North American continent are exotic in Europe or Japan. Think corn or sunflowers. Those European explorers took those back to Europe. And when that exotic plant escapes cultivation and grows successfully in the wild, we say it's become naturalized. An invasive plant by definition is non-native, somehow takes over the habitat, does some damage. And it would, when it becomes, oh, 
up a notch, really invasive, we call it noxious. And it's so invasive that there's actually regulation against it. In Ohio, Ohio consider, considers um, invasives and noxious plants to be synonymous. And there are 37 plants right now on Ohio's invasive plant list. And in 2023, it will be 38 when the calorie pair gets to make the list. Those are plants you cannot sell. It's against the law to sell them, propagate them, divide them, distribute them, import them, disseminate them in any way. Two other definitions that come up when we talk about natives. A wildflower is any plant in the wild that's flowering, but you're gonna find that people disagree about whether a flowering, a wildflower is native or not. So you have to be careful. Some believe that for a plant to be a true wildflower, it has to be native. And then finally, a host plant will come up in conversation in this, in this presentation. And it is a plant that supplies the food to the developing larvae of an insect. With butterflies, it's the plant where the female butterfly lays her egg. And when those eggs hatch, the caterpillar uses that plant for food. And we'll mention these as we go along. So it's really very difficult to separate native plant gardening from butterfly gardening and from pollinator friendly gardening. So now let's stop with the words and get on to some pictures. Here's some examples. Yarrow is a very interesting plant. It was introduced as an exotic, escaped. It's now naturalized. It's a wildflower, it's out there in the wild blooming. There are some species that are native, but it's not terribly invasive. And it has some good properties. Its nectar provides food for adult butterflies and pollinators. I'll bet when I said wildflower, perhaps this plant came, came to mind. It is the uh, Ohio's state wildflower, and it's the symbol of the Ohio plant, native plant initiative in Ohio. Um, late in 2019, the governor signed a, uh, a law that says, I guess it's not a law, it's a declaration that says Ohio is, uh, Ohio's native plant month is April. And that particular um, uh, project is gaining some impetus. They're actually thinking about doing it nationally. Here's purple loosestrife. This is the poster child for invasive takeover. By definition, it's not a native. It's so invasive, it's considered noxious. It's, and it is considered invasive and noxious in much of the United States. It outcompetes other plants that are hosts for native insects. And it can do other damage too. But there is a native loose strife. Um, it is yellow and doesn't look anything like this. Other dangerous invasives, um, garlic mustard, honeysuckle, some of those are so toxic to caterpillars when the female accidentally lays her egg on the wrong plant, those hatching larvae are, are poisoned by that plant. So how do you know what's native? There's plenty of internet information out there. You can actually drown in it. I'm gonna show you two examples. Now, Danny's going to give out a handout after the presentation um, via email, and these web addresses will be on that handout, so you don't need to scribble them down. Um, these are two places where I think you can get started to know what's native and what you might be able to use in your project. 
This is what the USDA um, plant database looks like. And I like this simply because I like to look at the maps there. So this is the uh, entry for Ritibida panata, the prairie coneflower. And you can search for names of plants either using their common name or their Latin name. And you can find out a lot of information about a particular plant. So this one tells us that it is native to Ohio and to most of the Eastern part of the United States. The second database that you might wanna think about is the National Wildlife Foundation database. Um, it helps you identify natives very specific to your area. You can add your zip code and you will come up with a list of native plants that can be found in your area. And there are similar databases um, from native plant societies and other similar groups. And you can see on the bottom of this slide, if you can read on it, this particular database is based on the research uh, from Dr. Talamy, who is, by the way, an entomologist uh, with the University of Delaware. So why do you wanna plant native plants? The first three reasons are reasons why they usually do very well in your flower beds. They're generally low maintenance, don't need to fertilize them. Once they get established, they're pretty drought uh, tolerant. They're good choices for informal gardening. You can grow in any season. They're usually better adapted to, to local environmental conditions. But quite frankly, it's those last two bullets that are really important ones. Native plants are an integral part of the food chain, the food web. They're essential for all wildlife, especially birds and insects. A high majority of caterpillars, of butterflies, simply can't digest non-native plants. They don't have the right enzymes in their stomachs. They didn't co-evolve along with plants. Remember the definition of native, that interconnectedness with the environment. 96% of our bird species raise their young on insect larvae, not on seed. So no insect larvae because they're not growing on the plants, then you're gonna have issues with bird, birds. Native plants provide the nectar and pollen for our pollinators. And without pollinators, we would have a real huge food crisis. One third of our food supply depends on pollinators. So if you plant natives, you're preserving native species, the biodiversity that goes with it, more natives equals more insects equals more birds all the way up the food chain. And if the food chain collapses, so does whatever depends on it. And quite frankly, eventually that means us. Now, Dr. Tallamy is the one who is bringing that sort of message to us. And I've been something of a disciple of his. I've always wanted to do a presentation and I, I would title it, The Gospel According to Tallamy, but I haven't gotten around to doing it yet. He published a book in 2007 called Bringing Nature Home, issuing a wake up call to suburbia saying, we can no longer have the, uh, the we, we have to think about how important gardening and flowers and natives are to our environment, not just that they look good. Ornament, ornamentation and beauty can no longer be the driver. It has to be the environment. And conservation areas are not enough. Nature needs our backyards. So that's an important concept 
to use native plants to support the wildlife that co-evolved with it. He likes to say insects are not optional. Late last year, he came out with another book um, called Nature's Best Hope. And uh, quite frankly, um, I think that's a better book. In fact, I'm giving you all a homework assignment. I want you to read both books and I would encourage you to read the second one first. And we're gonna talk about what he proposed to do in the second book, which is to set up a national homegrown park. So let's talk a little bit about where you can plant native plants. I will always say to you that the first commandment of horticulture is you have to put the right plant in the right location. And that goes for natives too. But you have choices when it comes to design. You can mix the natives with your perennials. Um, you can devote an entire bed to just, a, just natives. You can go really wild and make a prairie garden. You can go semi-wild and make a rain garden. I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Your style can be formal, informal, really wild. Do what you like. Here's some examples. This is so interesting. This is the um, native plant garden at the African grasslands in the zoo. And this picture's several years old. I think they still have it. But look, you can't even see any soil there. The plants are allowed to grow in masses. Lots of drifts is what I would call them. Mix your natives with your perennials in your, in your perennial garden. This is just a simple residential garden. This is my uh, central school rain garden where we had a topographical problem, a wet area. Um, there's a shallow depression there. We planted it with native wetland plants and grasses. And those natives have very complex root systems. So they collect the water, absorb it and filter it so that it goes through the soil instead of running directly to storm sewers. So it has a, uh, a place in, in and, uh, preventing flooding and some kinds of pollution get, get taken care of that way. These are kids that um, were able to spend their recess outside gardening with me instead of doing other things. I, I called it weeding for free with me. And this is their Monarch Way Station in the front of the school. It's certified as a, as a Monarch Way Station. It's a combination of host plants and nectar plants. And as you probably know, the Monarch Butterfly can, the caterpillar can only eat milkweed. So there's six different kinds of milkweed in there. It's devoted to butterflies, but you should have seen all the other things we, we attracted out there, a whole milkweed insect community. This is another garden I put in at um, the community garden in my town. Uh, the picture on the left is when we just had rocks planted. The picture on the right is a year later. Um, truly, if you plant it, they will come. We saw our first monarch caterpillar uh, just about a year after we planted. Still has room to grow. My theory on weed control is to plant the plants as des densely as possible so the weeds can't grow. Here's another small garden, a pollinator garden done by um, Sonia Bingham, who is with the Native Roots. Uh, she has a, a, a company called Native Roots in, Rich, in Richfield. Um, just around a flagpole and where the theme was yellow. And a prairie garden. 
Prairie means meadow, and it's used to describe some of the native grasslands that we used to have in Ohio. We once had over a million acres of prairie in Ohio, and now we only have remnants. Um, this particular prairie um, is in full sun with soil very rich in organic matter, and it's dominated by the grasses. It's also burned on a regular basis to keep it from getting too woody. And just so you know, that's not an option in residential gardening. The fire department would have my, my head if I ever said, burn your prairie. I have a friend though who has a, 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 a fairly wide, maybe 10 feet wide strip of prairie going along her entire house on one side. And there's very little maintenance involved there. Can you plant natives here? A couple of, um, let's see, it was early February. We had a nice Sunday and I hauled my husband out and said, let's go take a field trip to Waterloo. And I think the answer is you certainly can plant natives here. And this is what I saw on that Sunday. And I have some considerations that I thought we should talk about maybe at the end here. Again, the first commandment of horticulture, right plant for the right soil, right conditions. And I know you're going to get the soil tested. And what I'd like to point out to you is that it looks like lots of things grew quite well in those beds last year. Hard to tell what they were, but there's probably nothing terribly wrong with that soil. I will tell you also that there's, it's important to have compost, it's important to mulch, and maybe that's all you need to do if you have natives. I'm a little concerned about light because of the trees. Uh, obviously going out one time on a Sunday afternoon doesn't tell me anything about the light. Um, how much sun do you have in a day? How much shade? You know, full sun natives are going to need about six hours a day. You're going to get some shade from the trees, although the ones at this end of Waterloo are very columnar, so maybe shade won't be a problem. Moisture, I don't know. Do these beds have to be irrigated? I don't, I don't know. Um, dry versus moist, maybe plants that do better in drier conditions might be better here. I'm concerned about salt. I'm looking here in the middle of winter and I'm thinking, oh, salt trucks are going down that street and I'm quite sure they're, they're throwing rock salt into those beds. And you got a double whammy here because I think perhaps the building uh, uh, people might be doing the same thing for, this, for the uh, sidewalk. So salt used for ice and snow control can build up in, in, in a bed or in a container. And usually we see salt toxicity because of too much inorganic fertilizer. And when you have too much salt, it interferes with the water take up through the plant roots. It keeps water from getting into the roots. So I think when you're working out there this season, you're gonna to have to observe what's going on, see if there's evidence of root damage or leaf scorch, and then see what develop a plan to see what we can do about it. Um, this is why it's a good thing for you to have mentors. I just want to emphasize the art of observation um, so you see what's going on. The trees are something of a trade-off, aren't they? Who doesn't want the beauty and the shade of a tree along a, a streetscape? But the downside is the shade, so you need to observe what how the trees are shading. And of course, trees, if you plant trees and plants, um, the tree roots are gonna win, except that maybe they're shallow and they're more spreading and lots of natives will grow 
deeper than the tree roots in the soil horizon. And they'll get their nutrients and their water from a different place. So I think you have a lot of things to think about when you're planting out there. I think you probably know I'm a cheerleader for natives right now, um, my first choice, but there's a couple of things to think about that are necessary to curb any enthusiasm to just plant natives. First commandment of horticulture, but many of us don't have native soil anymore. And I'm sure the soil in those beds along Waterloo are not native. It could be subsoil that's been amended or, and it could be compacted, I, I can't tell. So you need to be cognizant of that. And are natives really better than non-natives? Well, just because a plant is native doesn't mean it belongs in one of those beds. Purism is not necessary. And by purism, I mean, Get rid of all the non-natives and only plant native. I'm not pure. I'm not a purist in my own yard. And I think Dr. Tallamy even would agree with me. He has something called a 75% rule. And he says, if you have to mix native and non-natives, at least have 75% native, 25% non-native, but no invasives. But just remember that any non-native takes up space that a native could use. Native ours. You know, plant breeders um, like to take natives and play with their genes. And when they create cultivars, they're looking at things they can sell to us as consumers. Um, a different shape of the plant, a different size, a different color, something like that. And they're not taking into consideration what those changes might mean for the insects that are dependent on those natives. So I would caution you to try to find the true native. And if you can't find the true native that hasn't been um, changed by breeding, then native ours than non-natives. Now, Dr. Tallamy, I, I, I saw a presentation by him um, uh, several weeks ago, and he understands the issues of, non, of native virus, and he's keeping a lot of grad students very busy getting their master's degree, testing whether native virus are making a difference by natives. And although the jury is out on conclusions, he will tell you that it looks like if you try to make natives leaves and stems purple instead of green, that's not a good thing. And nor is it okay to try to make a single flower double. Look at these cone flowers here. They have a nice flat top. That's good for the insects that need to land there to get pollen or nectar. And so if you make the flower double, you're making it difficult. Another ball that you have to keep in the air is all season color and interest. I would think that um, along Waterloo, you would like to see something blooming all the time if you could. But most natives have limited bloom times and actually most perennials do too. We struggle with this in all our perennial beds. Um, so you have to think about mixing these flowers so that you can get some interest in all of the seasons. So design, here's where the painting comes in. In our collaboration of art with nature, how are you going to compose your masterpiece? I like to think of myself as a plant artist. I do flower arrangements. I design perennial beds. And what are the basics that make things harmonious and pleasing to look at? And here's a couple of them that you can think about. 
This is a, um, a native garden, um, Kevin O'Brien's native garden. This garden is 36 feet by 30 feet. He's got a thousand plants in there, 47 different species, much more than you would need in Waterloo. And I would consider this something of a masterpiece. And he says he never spends more than two hours a week in it. That's cool. So here are the elements of design that, that, that I sort of think about when I'm, when I'm planting. We crave color. It's hardwired into our brains and we get it from the plants and we get it from what those plants attract. Think butterflies and birds. Think color harmonies. Get your, get your color wheel out, you know, monochromatic, polychromatic, complementary, analogous. Plants can be solid. They can be compact. They can be spreading. They have different forms. How does the sunlight play on a plant? With the shade or without the shade? I bet this garden looks very different at different times of the day and different times of the season. How does your eye move through this garden? Um, plants give us a lot of linear material with their stems and their branches. Does your eye stop somewhere and you don't wanna go on further? What you can't see in this garden because, um, because of the angle of the photograph, but there's a meandering path right through the middle. Plants have patterns, natural patterns in their, in their leaf veining and in their shape. Plants can be taller or shorter, wider or narrower, narrower. Color and texture sort of change the perception about what's going on. How your plants are, are placed creates movement or depth. The plant that's going along the border here is prairie drop seed. And it takes your eye all the way around that garden. There's texture in plants. Some are fuzzy, some are smooth, some are prickly. Lots of things to experiment. And as artists, I bet you would love to do that. And you can use native plants to do it. So I'd like to introduce you to a three ingredient recipe that we sometimes use in designing containers that I think you can use at Waterloo, both in your containers and in your beds. And when you see the handout, they will be organized like this. Remember, this is not a strict rule you have to follow. It's only a guideline. It's getting you to think about how things go together. There are 1800 native plants or plants native to Ohio. That's, that's a huge choice. It can overwhelm you. In fact, the plants I'm gonna show you tonight might be too much, but this will give you a place to start. So thrillers, the star of the show, architectural, usually taller, dramatic. They have something of a different shape. Maybe their flowers just catch your eye, unusual in some way. Fillers, maybe finely, more finely textured, weave through the thriller, cram in as many as possible, make the thriller look even better. And spillers, plants that drape over the edges. You can shoo or horn them into the edges. And maybe, maybe the four corners of those six by nine beds that I saw would be a great place to put a spiller. Softens the edges. You can echo or contrast what the thriller is. So I'm going to give you a, a number of examples. And I will be giving you both the common name and the Latin name and be sure you get the native if that's what you really want. And I will also tell you how to recognize a native R. So here we go. Rattlesnake Master. What an interesting name, isn't it? 
What makes it a thriller? Well, look at those thistle-like flower heads. They start out white and dry to an off-white. They give us texture and color changes throughout the season. Um, even the leaves, you, and you can't tell it from this particular photo, but they're a bluish gray. And here's what's really interesting. This plant is part of the parsley family. And the parsley family means that it will host swallowtail butterflies, especially the black swallowtail. Now the plant on the right is called goat's beard. It gives us wonderful feathery blooms, spring into summer, gets a little bushy, can grow up to oh, around four feet or so. There is a dwarf version, but that would make it a native R, but maybe that's not so bad. Bees and hummingbirds and other insects are very attracted to the pollen. And it is the only known host plant for the dusky azure butterfly, which is a beautiful gray and blue butterfly, which is very rare in Ohio now. So if you're familiar with a stilby, a plant, the plant, this is a good alternative to a stilby. And then it turns yellow in the fall. And it has good winter structure. The stems will stay upright and some of our native bees will winter over in the hollow stems. When, when you say prairie, I think of grasses and these flowers. So there are three different genera lumped together, commonly called cone flowers. Many native ours for these plants. They are the poster child children for playing in the gene pool without a lifeguard. Be careful that we're not losing that ecological component and search for the straight native first. The one on the left is the purple cone flower. Well known, easy to get. Purple droopy rays with the cone in the middle, a brownish spiny disc. No special soil needs, can ha actually handle a little bit of shade. It can get aggressive and spread. The middle cone flower, uh, the retibida, uh, the prairie cone flower, you might not be familiar with. We don't see too much of it around here, but I really like it as, as in a mix of cone flowers. This one tolerates heat and drought and floods and cold, and it's not particular about soil. It reseeds, but it doesn't seem to get aggressive. And it hosts a lot of butterflies. The silvery checker spot and the painted lady are two that really like this particular flower. And of course, all those cones are really seed heads. So if you leave them up in the winter, you will be feeding the birds. And the one on the right is the black eyed Susan. Very common, easy to grow, tasty to deer. And I don't know if you have a deer issue in, on Waterloo. Um, loved by landscapers, so this one is easy to get. A nice clumper. I suspect it's a native R. I suspect that this particular plant is Goldstrom. And if you look at a tag in a nursery and you see Rebecca Herta and then Goldstrom in single quotation marks, that means you have a native R. There are other, other Rebecca like Black-eyed Susans and sweet uh, black-eyed Susans. Great plants to put in a, in a garden. Grasses, I think, make great thrillers because of their shape. Um, they're great for wildlife, but most of the native ones are almost too overpowering for use at Waterloo. I believe some of them. Let's 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 remember what the reason they talk. They call the tall grass prairie. That is because the grasses sometimes can get up to nine feet. I don't think that would look so good in your beds, but little blue stem 
It's much more manageable. It's only gonna get about three feet or so. Beautiful blue green summer color turns reddish brown or even purple in the fall. And then in winter turns a very coppery color. And the leaves don't all look the same. They, there are different shades. Light changes what it looks like. It blooms in August, so we call it a warm season grass. And those fluffy seed heads will stay up probably until February if we don't have too much snow. What's interesting about this plant is that it's salt tolerant. So it might be a good choice for Waterloo. <clears throat> now the plants on the right are goldenrods, members of the sunflower families. And I debated whether to put this in here. How would a thriller that only blooms in fall work on Waterloo? Maybe you have to put multiple thrillers in your beds, but there are a lot of different goldenrods. In fact, a couple of years ago, the Natural History Museum published a book on just the goldenrods of Northeast Ohio. And there's over 20 different species. There's a stiff goldenrod that has flatter flowers. There's a very showy goldenrod that has a big plumes. And there's a zigzag goldenrod where the stems twist so the flowers look like they're spiraled. And there are over 20 species of butterflies that use this plant uh, for adult food. And we call this plant a keystone species. And it's a species on which other species in the ecosystem largely depend upon, such that if you removed the species, the ecosystem would change drastically or even collapse. So obviously it's good to throw some keystone species in, especially the ones that bloom in the fall just before winter begins. There, I'm gonna go on now to fillers. And the first one I wanna talk about is a butterfly weed, which is a milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. And as you may know, milkweed is the only food source for monarch ca caterpillars. No milkweed, no monarchs. That's the way it is. There are 13 different species of milkweeds that are native to Ohio. And on my bucket list is, is one of the things I wanna do is to grow every single milkweed that's native to Ohio. And I'm up to seven now. So, so I, I, I have about six more that I have to figure out how to grow in my yard. Um, try to grow the net ones that are native to your area. Uh, there, are, there are tropical milkweeds that you can get in a nursery. And there is some evidence that if you plant tropical milkweeds in Ohio, they sometimes upset the cues that a monarch needs to, to migrate. And all of these plants produce seed pods and have white milky sap, which gives them their common name of milkweed. So this one has less of the milky sap than others. It is salt tolerant. It likes dry to medium well-drained soil. Blooms June all the way through August. Its leaves look good well into the fall. And its seed pods also provide interest in the fall through the winter. Now this plant, it is said, produces exceptionally tasty nectar. Now, I don't know how they decide that, but um, botanists will tell you that nectar is sugar water, but apparently it tastes different depending on what plant is producing it. And it is said that butterfly weed is crack cocaine for butterflies. It is so good. Now you can find it in yellow too. In fact, it's I've just been able to, um, to find some seeds for a yellow butterfly weed. 
and it is now my next backyard experiment. I'm growing it. Um, I grew it last year. It did not bloom yet. And I'm going to watch it to see, is it liked by the butterflies and other pollinators as well as the orange or better? What would be better than crack cocaine? I don't know. So the plants on the right are asters, another keystone species, an important source of late season nectar before migration begins for the monarchs or the bumblebees go into, into their type of hibernation. It can get six foot tall, but it spreads rather than stands upright. And you can cut it back a little bit during, during the, the summer to form a more compact plant. Now be careful when you go shopping for asters because um, the word aster sometimes refers to some of the European varieties. So make sure you get the native ones. And there probably are about 20 different native asters. Here's another plant where you have um, lots of choices. The tick seeds or coreopsis um, come in a variety of different species. They have a long bloom time. And if you keep deadheading them, they'll keep on blooming. Very tolerant of poor soil and drought. And they provide seeds for birds and attract butterflies as well as moths. They even have their own specialist insect. It's called a long-tongued Coreopsis minor bee. So this is really a, a, a nice filler that you might wanna think about in your beds. Here are two more. Heliopsis heliantoides is a mouthful to say, but it basically means sunflower-like. It's not tall and straight like the sunflowers we're used to seeing, but it's gorgeous. Um, it, it, it gives us beautiful triangular shaped leaves with um, double or single daisy-like flowers that are usually yellow or orange with a little cone in the middle. So they're kind of like the cone flowers. It needs sun, but it's not particular about other things. Now the plant on the right is my uh, favorite plant for 2020. I finally got this to bloom profusely in the pollinator gardens at my community garden. Gets lots of branches, forms a very bushy plant, doesn't seem to mind anything in the soil, competes well with the grasses, and it is absolutely covered with pollinators while it's blooming. And you have other mountain mints too, um, not just this one. Now bee balm, is a plant that I'm, I'm more used to talking about when I give um, presentations on herbs. It's in the mint family, pleasantly fragrant, kind of has a taste, a similar smell to, like oregano. Um, it, it makes a great tea and it really has an American revolutionary history because this is what the colonists went to for tea after the Boston Tea Party upset their supply chain. It looks spectacular in summer, but it can get a little tired by autumn. Sometimes if we have a very dry summer, it goes into dormancy. If we have a moist summer, sometimes it gets powdery mildew, but it is salt tolerant, a pollinator powerhouse, especially for native bees. So this year, my 2021 plant, I think, is going to be the spotted bee balm. I'm trying to grow it this year from seed. It has a cream colored petals with uh, purple spots in them. So I'll let you know how it turns out. Now, this slide captures my ambivalence about using the three ingredient uh, recipe that I started out with. Maybe those geraniums should be a spiller. Who knows? 
maybe that Culver's route is really a thriller, but you have the option of doing and designing that in one of your beds. The wild geranium on the left doesn't look anything like the annual geranium that you might be used to. It slowly spreads and forms a carpet and it's actually spilling over a rock border in that garden. It can handle some shade and it will spread and will probably need editing after a couple of years in a bed. It blooms um, beginning in April all the way through to July and it stays good looking through fall and even in winter. Mine, mine is still green from, from last year. Now Culver's root is a spectacular plant. I, it, it has beautiful wand-like white flowers, spikes that begin in midsummer, and then it's followed by seed pods. So it gives you some fall and winter um, interest. And this plant is associated with a very complicated food chain that involves moths and woodpeckers and cicada killer spot, uh, wasps. So it's a very interesting plant if you ever wanna dig in deeper and see what it's like. In the original prairies and wetlands, sedges were critical because they provided um, food for certain animals. Now, these animals are not gonna be seen on Waterloo because they include muskrat and beaver and elk and moose. And so you're not gonna grow this plant for wildlife, but sedges give you some interesting design choices. They can be used as borders or focal points or exclamation points. Some of them stay green all the way through winter. And some of them do very well under the shade of a tree. Just don't fall into the monoculture trap like it's in the right photo. I think there's too many sedges there and diversity is a little bit better. So let's go to spillers, almost done. Are you, I hope I haven't lost any of you yet. To be truthful, natives don't give us a whole lot of choices for spillers, but your beds might not need them. Certainly you'd wanna put one in those containers that you have. Think about strawberries. There is a, or, excuse me, let's go back to verbena. Um, Definitely a sprawling plant, gets up to about two feet, looks a lot like phlox, blooms in the late spring to the early, uh, late spring to late summer, needs full sun, visited by a lot of pollinators, and there are several butterflies that especially like its, its, um, its nectar. The problem with rose verbena is sometimes it gets infected with aphids, so you have to be careful. And the second spiller that I thought might work in your beds is wild strawberries. Um, the ones on the left look just like cultivated ones, but they're very, they're much smaller and they're, they're edible. The one on the right um, is not. Uh, that one prefers acidic soil but it's salt tolerant and you can't eat those berries. But that one spreads by runners too. So they form mats that spill over whatever rim is on your container or on your bed. And both of these can handle some shade. And then the third spiller, wild ginger, the one on the left. You may be familiar with European ginger it has a much glossier leaf, um, but there are heart or kidney shaped leaves um, with rather indistinct flowers. You can see the flower way down here, usually hidden. So you're gonna grow it for as a ground cover. This one has to have shade in a medium to wet soil. So if you have a place that might work and the prairie drop seed on the right, is the border of the garden we saw earlier. It's a nice 
bunch forming grass, pretty low, blooms in the fall, turns golden in the fall, gives you some winter interest. And you could plant it so it leans a little bit over the edges of the curbing on your beds. Now, I've given you some examples and I wanted to tell you about one thing that I did find in doing research for this presentation. I really found very little information on using native plants in containers. But what I did find was a brochure from the Missouri Native Plant Design uh, or the, the Missouri Prairie Foundation. In this brochure um, on the handout that Danny's going to give you uh, or at that website, you'll be able to download that and see if any of these combinations might work in those containers that you have, the black ones that I saw, not the bigger six by nine beds. And there may be other places where you can use it. So these have different plants in than the ones we just talked about. And looking at those, these, they're kind of following the same thriller, spiller, thriller, filler, spiller um, recipe. This one, I believe, is going to be a blue and yellow combination. And this one, too, uses a grass and some blue flowers and puts in those cone flowers. So, as Susan said while she was introducing herself, it's kind of hard to find these plants. They're not mainstream yet. Um, and all of these things are listed in, your, in the handout you're gonna get. Um, local nurseries usually don't have the straight native, they have native ours. There is a, uh, a spreadsheet under the Ohio Native Plant uh, Month website that lists all the sources of native plants in the state of Ohio. You could go on field trips from now until oh, fall looking for things. There are a good number of plant sales in the area. Now you would have to check on this because some of these weren't held last year because of the pandemic. Um, the Wilderness Center I know is scheduled to have their plant sale in April, but I, I believe you have to order online. And the Soil and Water Conservation District had a spring sale where you had to sign up in March. They're gonna have another one in fall. And I've had some very good experience with um, some of the catalog places and ordering the mail order. So let's use Sue's, um, Sue's experience, she says she knows where to get them. So let's, let's think about that. So what else do you need to know? Oh, there's so much to tell you. I, there's so much to learn and the best way to learn it is to probably just do it. But here's some things you might wanna think about. You know, native gardens sometimes get bad raps for being messy or untidy. So the trick there is to make them look intentional. And I think your beds out there with that curbing are gonna take care of that. And I would recommend that the best way to start your perennials is to use plugs. It will take too long, I believe, with seeds. You can get bigger plants, but I don't, you know, they're gonna cost a lot more money. And if you start planting perennials down the road, you're going to have to eventually edit. But that's a good thing. Um, there's more plants for somewhere else, someone else, more community sharing going on. And by all means, don't obsess over anything. Not everything's going to turn out perfectly. You might make a mistake. Okay, you can correct it. There will be weeds. Yeah, you're, 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 participating in a grand experiment. Nothing beats trying it for yourself. And even though you read about what a plant needs, 
Sometimes it's not completely true. Push the envelope a little bit. Enjoy what you're doing. It's a grand experiment. And I want to give you guys a gold star, although I don't think it's you guys, um, for not cleaning up last year. When I went out there and saw um, plant material still laying there, that's a good thing. Butterflies and our bees winter over. Sometimes in hollow stems, sometimes they form chrysalises that look like leaves. Learn to love leaf litter. Let it fall in the beds and leave it alone until spring and don't start cleaning up until we reach 50 degrees consistently. That's probably late March. And the last thing I wanna share with you is my prediction that you are going to fall in love with this project. You will embrace it even if it frustrates you. And here's an option to help you with the embracing. In Talamy's last book, Nature's, Nature's Best Hope, he coined the term and developed the concept of growing a homegrown national park. Areas of native plantings in your yard, in your community. He claims that the national, the natural areas that we've set a, aside, like in the national parks, are just not enough. Every one of us has to contribute. And he's thrown out a 20 million acre goal. That's bigger than the combination of all our major parks together. How are you gonna do it? Well, Dr. Tallamy thinks that if you reduce your lawn by 50%, we can reach that goal. Think of lawn as an area rug rather than wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. And you can do it by planting natives we're all connected. Here's the map that's been set up. And I hope that perhaps you use natives in some of your beds and you can, you can um, certify them or put them in the homegrown national park. I hope, and I, I hope I've opened up some new ideas for you, new concepts. And you may want to go and dig deeper into any one of these plants. And good luck to you all trying to re weave native in, win natives into your plants for all the right reasons.